Indian, 800,000 men, women and children, the survivors of a nation of five million Indians, a people hidden from public view and public conscience. Indianness, being Indian means a refusal to become extinct. Indian people cannot be white, they have to be who they are. You may teach them, train them to live in the white world, but they must be allowed to remain as Indians and to practice their own religion and philosophy. In order to do this, it means that we need land because we're tied to the land. In most Indian life, it's part of us. Uh, it means the trees, the rivers, all life is part of us. So we are fighting for land as well as a right to determine our own destinies. What are the Indians' legal rights to land, natural resources, and tribal sovereignty? They are buried in more than 2,000 regulations, 389 treaties, 2,000 federal court decisions, and 500 opinions of the Attorney General, which protect the tribe's rights forever. The United States government made treaties with the Indians as one sovereign nation to another in their high-powered documents. But the United States refuses to honor their treaties. What am I gonna do about it? Fight. What else can you do? You fight them in courts, you fight them any way you can. When the treaty was something they, that benefited them, then they wanted us to live by it, right? But now that the treaty might benefit the Indian a little bit and take away the profit from the white man, now they don't want to honor it. So this documentary is not to help us, it's to wake up the white people. Because this is their treaty, just like it's their Bible and it's their Constitution of the United States. It's not ours. And if they're not going to live up to them, it's them that, it's not us they're going to destroy, it's themselves. In the last 200 years, there have been many treaties and laws made relating to Indians, and this is the area that we call Indian law. I think too often in the past, these rights have not been protected and not been asserted. Unfortunately, I think a lot of that was the result of the fact that Indians were pretty well beaten down by the whole system, but that's, that's not true anymore. I think Indians can be a part of the system and can assert their rights through this body of law called Indian law. The Native American Rights Fund is a national Indian legal services program representing Indian tribes and individuals across the country in cases of major significance where they can't afford to retain counsel. The program was initiated in 1970 uh, with a grant to the California Indian Legal Services Program which expanded their services nationwide and after a year under the California program, the staff was relocated to Boulder, Colorado because it's the most convenient place in terms of the type of work we do, which is serving tribes all over the country. The reason uh, the NARP program was launched was to provide Indians who, who didn't have counsel before with the uh, lawyers necessary to resolve some of the major issues they were facing. Pro -tribe, and I think, uh, the selection of cases is handled by the staff and our total staff is about 50 people, 20 of these being lawyers. Of those 20 lawyers, about 13 or 14 are Indian attorneys. Almost all of our non-attorney staff is composed of all Indian people. The National Indian Law Library, which is a project of the Native American Rights Fund, contains uh, briefs and pleadings from virtually all of the cases ever decided on Indian affairs. 
we put together a comprehensive index to Indian law that has references to all these materials and where they can be found. This material is available to tribes and attorneys working with Indians all across the country. The attorneys here in the program use it quite extensively, and I think it's been one of the reasons why we've been very well prepared when we have gone into court. One of the first cases that we got involved in uh, early in the life of the program was the uh, treaty fishing rights case up in the Northwest, uh, United States against Washington. There were several tribes uh, up there that had treaty rights to assert that didn't have representation. And uh, David Getches, who was the founding director of the program, undertook uh, to represent them. The Indians were uh, truly oppressed in their attempts to fish. It's something that uh, people outside the state of Washington simply don't understand. Why is it so important uh, to the non-Indians that the Indians not fish? The answer is a mixture of uh, economics and a desire for recreational pleasure. The competitors for the fish are sportsmen and the commercial salmon fishing industry, a multi-million dollar industry in the state of Washington. These forces came to play against the Indians. They had sufficient political power so that uh, the enforcement authorities of the state of Washington were brought to bear against illegal Indian fishing. It's true, Indians were fishing contrary to state law, but they had contended that their treaty rights enabled them to uh, fish without state licenses, without following the state regulations as to time, place, and manner. And what resulted was as uh, brutal a police reaction toward Indian fishing as you can imagine being visited on blacks in the South attempting to exercise their civil rights. They set up an encampment on the riverbanks, and that encampment was set upon by scores of uniformed officers. Now, at that time, the land was not understood clearly to be Indian land, which it is now. It's within the boundaries of the Puyallup Indian Reservation. But Indians were, in effect, on their own land, exercising a treaty right, and were rousted from their encampment. When the Indians were taken away to jail, their encampment was bulldozed, and their personal property was lost or destroyed. The lawsuit was filed against this backdrop, and the uh, violence on the riverbanks was in large part responsible for precipitating the filing of that lawsuit by the government. I filed an action against the state of Washington, the State Department of Game, the State Department of Fisheries uh, and their officers, um, stating that, uh, in my opinion, uh, state regulatory statutes were unconstitutional and they abrogated the uh, treaty rights uh, which the Indians had acquired in the 1850s. Over the course of uh, several weeks in trial, the case unfolded uh, rather dramatically before a judge that we were frankly very worried about, uh, Judge Bolt. I think it is uh, a very, very regrettable thing that uh, a case like this case was not brought to the courts 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, had it been carried through in the way this case was conducted to bring out and determine the law applicable in the interpretation of these treaties, I'm confident we would have avoided much of the bitterness that has built up among the Indians because of their mistreatment during that time. And it would have been better for the non-Indians to have known that the Indians had rights which they were bound to respect. The Bolt decision establishes that the treaties that were signed in the 1850s are a contract between the United States and the treaties and the state of Washington must observe that contract. And it provides that the Indians shall have 
an opportunity to take up to 50% of the fish. That's the meaning of the language in common with other citizens. It's a right to take up to an equal share at the usual and accustomed fishing stations. I, I don't give a damn about the 50%, but just take a, take a better share of the fish is what, what we're talking about. There's no way that the Indians can muster enough gear and boats to catch even 10% of the total run or their harvestable run. When you get a gill net from a cannery, and then you got to give them half of what you make. And uh, they kind of keep you in a hole. By the time you get your net paid for, well, you got to buy another net. Usually nine times out of ten, you can't, you can't pay for the complete net. And the boats, they run pretty high, too. So that's where the Indian is, right here in the river, with a little short net and with things that he can afford. I would say that our fishermen are happy with the boat decision. And what we did was try to determine best ways to boost the economy on the reservation. Most of our people fish during the winter months, so that's where we settled on building a processing plant. And since then, we're getting on our feet so that we're becoming more and more self-sufficient all the time. The Bolt decision has had a, a great effect upon us in that we, we have a much better product. We can sell them a lot easier than we could before. Before we only had the river fish. Now we have saltwater fish, which is a, it's a better product. It's, it's easier to market. The Quinault Reservation fishery is entirely under the control of the Quinaults and not under the control of the state. And we have had no problem in managing our fishery. And we're going to be able to come back to court next year and point out to Judge Bolt that one tribe, the Quinaults, can manage their fishery. And I hope this leads to the judge recognizing the ability of other tribes to manage their fisheries. For us, fishing is, is a way of life. It's, it's not a way of earning a living. It's a way of life. And every one of these fishermen on this river, that's the way they feel. Without fishing, I think they, they wouldn't be alive. I'm really confident that the situation will ease when uh, the non-Indians realize that Indians aren't out to devastate the resource, that their real motivation is to uh, simply make a decent living in the way that their forefathers hoped they would by having the bargain that they struck in 1855 carried out and that they can also maintain a culture, a culture which is rooted in the ability to continue a fishing practice that is similar to what their forefathers did. What's left out of USV Washington is, is this whole phase, so-called phase two problem. Phase one dealt with the existence of the treaty right and allocation of the resource between the, the two user groups, the Indian and the non-Indian user groups. The steering committee of the Native American Rights Fund is composed of 13 Indian people from different parts of the country and is set up to provide the direction and also the monitoring of the program. That's the group that determines what we do here and in our actual performance, whether we're living up to their directions and accomplishing the goals that they've set. What is it we can do today? What is it we can do 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now? See, I mean, we, we haven't looked at our priorities on a long-term basis in the beginning, so there is sort of a need to take a look at it. Maybe they're, maybe they're OK. I don't know, but that's what well, it's all about. Well, since you, I like travel existence is our number one priority. I mean. What other reason would, be, would we be in business for? Because we get such a wide range of uh, requests for assistance, we've had to make a determination as to those things which are most important, the things that uh, the program should be working on. Uh, we've defined these in terms of a set of priorities, and those priorities include uh, issues revolving around uh, tribal sovereignty, tribal natural resources, human rights of Indian people, accountability of governments to Indian people, and also dissemination of information regarding the legal rights of Indian people. 
because without maintaining the sovereignty of the tribes and without maintaining their resource base, then in effect there are going to be no tribes. My father, my father before him and my father before them lived right on this land and I plan on living here. I want my children to live here. Land to Menominees, as with uh, all other Indians, is sacred. We respect it. We revere it. It's uh, the source of our culture. And without it, uh, Indian people uh, suffer culturally, uh, economically, psychologically. We Menominees, in the 1800s, uh, ceded uh, thousands of acres of land. Over a period of time, this has meant the loss of over nine and a half million acres of our land. In exchange for a reservation established in 1854 of 235,000 acres. We were a reservation to 1954 when uh, termination occurred. Actually, termination meant the end of federal supervision of our tribe. It meant cultural, economic, and political disaster for the Menominee tribe. Well, termination stripped away all federal ties, including the many federal programs that exist for Indians, scholarships, health uh, programs, and the like. The tribes lost tribal sovereignty. Uh, that's a complicated concept, but basically it means that Indian tribes are governments. And uh, governments in very this, much the same sense as a state is or a county is. And when their land was lost, their sovereignty was lost. People were uh, very, very sad. It was a real sad time. They were almost like dead inside. They felt that they were hopeless, helpless, and didn't really know what to do to uh, stop the land sales. They realized that if the land went, then they'd also be gone. When our land was sold in a partnership with a developer. Our people became very concerned, became very uh, incensed over this, and we started a grassroots movement called DRUMS, Determination of Rights and Unity for Menominee Shareholders. We decided that we would fight for our land and our people. We worked for restoration, for stopping of the land sales, and for having Menominees in positions of power and leadership. Joe Prolosnik, who was the director of Judicare, contacted NARF uh, to, if, to see if we'd be able to assist the Menominee tribe, and particularly the drums uh, people, in uh, drafting up a bill uh, which would be presented to the Congress, United States Congress, which would basically reverse termination insofar as that tribe was concerned. Most congressmen and senators had no idea of what termination was. The statutes were long and complex, and they dealt with a field, Indian law, Indian policy, which very few people were interested in. We had to go out door to door, and telephone to telephone. We had newsletters. We had uh, individual contacts uh, through the Moccasin Telegraph, as uh, many Indians know. And through this, uh, we obtained the support of our people. With this unified support, then, they took the bill to the United States Congress, and they, uh, they by, of course, before they even did this, they got the support of their, of their local congressmen, the local senators, and the local representatives. And in 1973, after many hearings and uh, appeals to the Congress, uh, it was passed into law, the Menominee Restoration Act, which basically reversed the whole termination policy. There were several major aspects to actually implementing the whole restoration movement. And NARF then uh, committed ourselves to working with the tribe over as long a period of time as was necessary to basically complete all of the major phases of restoring the tribe and reversing termination completely. <laughs> In 
april of this year they will have the first elections under their new constitution and new governing body will be established and as far as nar for concerned that is the last step in the implementation of the restoration act and the reversal of the termination process total it took from nineteen seventy three until nineteen seventy seven to reverse what happened to them during termination over the long range their lumber mill has to be gotten on to a firmer footing and they need new machinery and all this sort of thing has to be dealt with and jobs have to be created they've got new federal programs started and so forth the tribe is beginning now to put itself back on an economic footing over the long term it's gonna be a long time before they're finally back in as good a position as they were before termination but they're on their way now where they can finally reach that goal I'm going to read to you an Indian legend and we're going to read out of a very pretty book. It's a very pretty color. Now, when I was a little bitty girl, my father and my grandfather used to tell me that the Creator loved us so very, very much that he made our skin the same color as sand. Menominee so children are fortunate to have their own teachers in their own schools on their reservation. On the Navajo reservation, the situation's different. There, NARF has had to file several suits to stop discrimination in the public schools. San Juan County uh, is one of the largest counties in the United States. It's about the size of the state of New Jersey. The northern two-thirds of the county is non-reservation, and the southern one-third is the Indian reservation. And there are two major communities off the reservation. Blanding and Monticello, where the high schools are. The kids living on the reservation, if they want to live at home and attend high school, they've got to make the bus ride. And it's the bus ride that's the whole basis of this litigation. The longest bus rides are about 90 miles long, one way, 180 miles round trip. The distance works out to about 24,000 miles a year. So the kid in the school year, if he went every day, you know, he'd travel the equivalent distance of five times across the United States, back and forth. Plus, yeah, the time that takes for them to get to the bus. Uh, so you know, we had kids who were traveling uh, two and a half, three hours one way every day. Um, you know, it just didn't seem right. And that was when Eric Swenson called us in. DNA is a, an abbreviation for a, a long Navajo word, which basically means lawyers working for the Navajo people. We did feel that, that because of the, uh, of the press of our routine work that we just didn't have the resources to do this lawsuit by ourselves. And that's why we consulted the Native American Rights Fund and asked their assistance. They have several uh, education attorneys and a, a a good deal of resources that enable them to uh, be of great assistance in doing a lawsuit like this. And our clients, of course, uh, in considering the, the stakes that were involved, the education of generations of children wanted the very best representation possible. The Indian kids on the reservation were faced with three options. They could make a long bus ride. They could go into the Bureau of Indian Affairs boarding schools. And the third option is they could go into some sort of foster home or boarding home, either in Blanding or up in northern Utah. 24 years ago, when I was in the facing program, I found out myself that it was really hard to be so far away from home and staying with some people that you don't know. And I found that some of these parents that you stay with uh, doesn't really like for you to be in their home like the people say they would. My boy had the hardest year this last year. He was a football player and he has to stay up and blend and at the end of the year he just kind of gave up. These kids, they want to be on some of the things that goes on in the school like football playing and take part in some of the activity that goes on there. But they can't, they just have to ride the bus. And if our school was near, I don't think 
these things would, could have happened. We had a lot of kids dropping out, not going to school at all. They didn't want to make one of the three choices, Bureau of Indian Affairs, school, uh, foster home, or make the bus ride at all. So that was one of the basis of our claims. We knew that to, to litigate this question would be a long, involved trial. So I think the best way to deal with them is in forms of consent decrees and not with a judge up in Salt Lake City ordering the district to do something, but if we can work out a consent decree, uh, it, it has a far greater chance of working. There was a lot more to lose as far as the relationship between Navajo and, and Anglo citizens of the school district uh, if they went into court and went through uh, legal hassles and uh, maybe down to accusations, uh, personalities, and uh, so forth, that, that it would probably cause a greater division mm -hmm. uh, between the ethnic groups if they went to court than if they was to settle out of court in a, in a peaceful manner. The court is required that, that they give a very strict accounting of, of the, uh, the type of facility they're putting in down here over the, the next uh, uh, several years in order to ensure that, that these schools will indeed be adequately equipped, adequately staffed, and be ready to meet the needs of Indian children who, who need uh, uh, a, a great deal of attention right now due to the collective received in the past. As a result of the negotiations, the bilingual education has now been adopted as uh, part of the basic curriculum of the San Juan School District. The district has also agreed to teach the non-Indians about Indian society and Indian cultures. So that the children up on the northern portion of the, res of the district who, who don't have Indian students in their classrooms, who are going to live in this county, are going to have to deal with the Indian population in an equal and fair manner, will have some appreciation and some understanding of the Indian societies, the Indian cultures, so that you don't have misunderstandings, you don't have um, ignorance between the two cultures, the two societies. Problems had always been here. Clients had always complained about them. It's just that no one ever listened to them. And I suppose that's the one of the very uh, good aspects of using the, the adversary system. Uh, the legal system because it enables uh, clients who uh, perhaps are not so well heard to uh, be heard on a very high and a very vocal level. And our clients, of course, uh, took full advantage of that as they well should have. I never even knew there was a lawyer exists in this country. And there, I never even knew there would be people that could help a person with some problems. Another area in human rights that we're involved in is the right to freedom of religion, especially in the prisons. Inmates at the Nebraska Penal and Correctional Complex in Lincoln, Nebraska, filed a pro se complaint in federal court alleging all forms of discrimination against them and we were later asked to represent them in, in the federal court. Right down here from uh, about 17 on down is where we have four or five Indians living. And we uh, want to bring out the fact that the conditions of this, this area is one of the worst in the cell house. Something like 270 some men are expected to shower within a period of a half an hour. With only six showers. Here, right here, is one cell we'd like to touch up on. It's uh, where an Indian fellow lives. This cardboard here is put here to keep the steam out. This uh, humidity is so bad that it sweats in here. Four, four lights, no ventilations. Maybe the best thing that we've done is uh, attempted to sensitize prison officials that, that um, as to the unique needs of the Indian prisoners, their unique rehabilitative needs, their unique cultural needs. Surprisingly enough, a large number of the prison officials that we've negotiated with, once uh, the, uh, we've been able to educate them, they've been very receptive to attempting to to uh, meet these types of needs once they've been, once they realize that they have a, a, a in fact, a different set of prisoners. I had very little contact knowledge 
of the uh, traditions and the uh, culture of the Indians prior to coming here, other than being exposed to what I call the Hollywood stereotype situation. But as we got into the situation, I become, became very familiar with the fact that uh, Hare was indeed a uh, uh, very religious type of uh, situation with Indians, and that, that it required, if a man was to follow his uh, Indian beliefs, that he have long hair and be allowed to braid it at a given time. And it was then that I began to understand why the Indians uh, in Nebraska were suing to retain some of their cultural identity. At first, the institution was reluctant in, in uh, following a court order, but now they decided that they're going to give us a sweat lodge and our religion and let the medicine men come in with uh, fundings from the state like the other denominations have here. We were able to obtain a supplemental decree in that case which provided for the, the construction of a uh, sweat lodge, which um, a lot of the prisoners can use to develop this sense of spirituality and, and cultural awareness that is a part of being an Indian. Another one I knew how on top I thought. When I stick the thought knock stuff to you, I told you. I told him you get some yagan and call me. I'll get there. Well, the purpose of Sweat Lodge, and where it all begins from, is from these rocks. And these are the oldest of all things on Earth, Mother Earth, which you call Tunka. And then we're going to need the water, and we can't live without water. And we can't live without the heat. From this, we purify ourselves with this. Then we pray to Wakan Tunka, the great mystery. With all this, then we're going to need a peace pipe. All works out there to me. Even in those prison systems that attempt to meet the Indian prisoners' needs, they're still prisons and basically run by non-Indians. NARP's alternative to incarceration project is to transfer these prisoners and use the vacant job corps center on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation where Indian people and Indian culture could be utilized as the prime rehabilitation tool. When you consider that our population is about 800,000 and over half of them are uh, women and children and uh, young people, and you consider that we have literally thousands of Indian men in prisons throughout this country, you have to be concerned. Janet McLeod is one of our steering committee members who was very uh, instrumental in causing North to form our Indian prison project and has been working very closely in the state of Washington at McNeil Island with the Indian inmate group up there called the Brotherhood of American Indians. If they are not paroling you because they say you're hostile to whites, but they parole whites even if they're hostile to Indians, this is something North can get into. These people here, when they give us the right to wear our hair long, they didn't give us the right, they give it to us as a privilege. And they can take it back any time no, they want No, that's not true, David. That may be what they're telling you. But they have suspended all hair regulations in, hair, uh, in, the, in the federal prisons. And they, they may be... As a result of her outspoken <laughs> criticism against the Federal Bureau of Prisons, she was barred from going into the prison there. So we filed suit against the federal prison system on Janet's behalf and on behalf of the Brotherhood. We were subsequently able to settle that case and, and got Janet back into the penitentiary there. I was innocent, but they wouldn't allow me to uh, testify in my own behalf in court. And then during the process of appealing this uh, decision, the uh, court-appointed attorneys uh, wouldn't allow me to plead self-defense. Uh, they wouldn't even plead self-defense for me. They wouldn't listen to what happened. They, uh, they were angry at me merely because I was Indian, not because I had uh, gotten involved in a fracas. Most of these court-appointed attorneys only get so much to uh, try a case. They want to spend the least amount of time and take the least trouble. This is what our research in that area has found. Yeah, this is true. So they, they want you to plead guilty so they can get it over with and uh, use you tell you that you'll get a lighter sentence if you do. This is what they tried to do to me. And I was convicted of uh, first degree premeditated murder. When I live here no longer 
take my spirit home to you. Great Spirit, this prayer song, oh, courage to be strong. We're just as uh, free as the Indian that's locked up in a, in a prison, and we've, we've got to think that way. But on the other hand, we have to pay equal attention to the, to the beautiful things in life, because there still are things that, that's beautiful in life, whether it's trying to create things with your own hand through beadwork or through painting. <laughs> I used to have a real sad feeling. You know, every time I left, I just about cry. I don't feel that way so much anymore, you know. A lot of things have happened in 10 years. And I've seen a lot of them get out. A lot of them make positive lives for themselves. So I don't, I don't feel that way no more. Calf there is the only one of the of the crop this year, but uh, might see a few more here next year. When did the tribe decide to get this started up again? How about uh, the monetary rewards that uh, we receive as as attorneys may not be as as high or as great as we would be able to make other places, but I think most of us feel that. What we're doing here is, is especially important. It's a unique opportunity to make a contribution. Started off with a herd of about five. Just like any attorney has to meet and, and uh, discuss things with his clients, answer questions, we have to do the same thing. But since our clients live all over the country, then we have to travel out and meet them. And that requires us to spend a lot of time traveling to a lot of different parts of this country. Northern Cheyenne Tribe is located in southeastern Montana, and at present time they're involved in litigation to define their water rights. It requires me to go up to Montana and out to the reservation a couple times a year to give progress reports uh, to the tribal council. We're arguing one thing is certainly going to be contested. Is this winner's doctrine right, the ownership of the water by the tribe from time immemorial? The state's not going to stand for us making that kind of claim. They're going to fight us all the way. They're going to say, you, you guys weren't entitled to any water until 1884, 1900, or later. There's a cloud on the title of almost all of the water rights in the West until these winner's doctrine rights of all the tribes are decided. The winner's doctrine protected the water rights of the tribe against intrusions by non-Indians. The doctrine says that the tribes are entitled to water from the time their reservations created or from time immemorial. The first case that the Native American Rights Fund became involved in was the water rights case on behalf of the Pyramid Lake Paiutes. In that situation, the tribe, which depends very much on Pyramid Lake and its fishery, was being denied the water to maintain the level of the lake by the actions of the federal government, which is supposed to be the trustee for the tribe. The lead attorney on the Pyramid Lake case was Robert Palsiger. One way... Uh to solve the problem was to try to get the enormous resources of the federal government behind us rather than fighting us. The first suit that we filed was in fact against the government, against the Secretary of the Interior, and that led in progressive stages to uh, the situation we're in now where finally we got the government to bring the lawsuit we wanted them to bring against all of these water users. And there are 15,000 people who have various interests in the water rights along the Truckee River. The tribe's demands are very reasonable. They're um, asking for uh, sufficient water only to maintain the lake at its present level, not the level that it was 70 years ago before any diversions took place. In fact, virtually everything that we're asking for can be obtained if the 
water users on the Truckee River were more careful in the way that they used their water. For example, water isn't metered and it costs the same amount if you use it carefully or if you waste it. All that time they were doing that, there was that absolutely nothing, no concern about Pyramid Lake. It was declining 70 feet. They're killing our lake, and the government is responsible for allowing all the dams to be built on Truckee River, and we've lost about 70 feet of water. All that white you see on those rocks used to be underwater. Many years ago, when I was young, my great-grandfather, he was one of the chiefs. He controlled the Paiute tribe. Uh, fishing was very good in Pyramid Lake. The Indians used to fish for this great, big, long-hunting cutthroat trout. It wasn't planted by state or the United States government, Mother Nature had put these trouts in Pyramid Lake and they grew to be the biggest trout in the world. The Newlands Project was, was uh, one of the first, perhaps the first uh, project under the Reclamation Act. The Reclamation Act was started and uh, was passed by Congress in 1902 and Derby Dam completed construction on it in 1906. Senator Newlands was the primary sponsor of the Reclamation Act. And he, along with other West senators, were very, very strong advocates of reclaiming the West by uh, building expensive water diversion projects, storing water, and irrigating land. Indians call uh, Derby Dam the killer. Uh, it was a killer because it killed the lake by um, diverting the flows over to the Newlands Project across those mountains. It was a killer because it killed the fish. There wasn't enough water for them to get up the river to spawn. And they couldn't get above Derby Dam. Looks like a pretty innocuous, innocent looking structure, but it's a killer. The first lawsuit that uh, we brought on behalf of the Paiutes we sued the Secretary of the Interior and basically said he had been violating for many years his obligations to protect the interests of the Indians. The court agreed with us in a very important decision that uh, really for the first time Indians uh, got their property back, they got water back that had been taken from them. Previously uh, Indians had been relegated to a damage remedy, to being paid for property that had, for land, for water, for other property that had been taken away from them. But here the Indians sued the government and established that precedent that they could prevent the government from uh, failing to uh, protect their property. Now they've joined with the tribe in trying to establish the tribe's water rights, but it's going to be long, it's going to be lengthy, it's going to be appealed going to go to the Supreme Court, but we feel now, the Paiutes feel and lawyers feel, things are beginning to turn around. Well, at this point, uh, I personally feel very optimistic of the future for the tribe. This uh, gives you a great deal of oomph, I would say, to, uh, to know that you have, uh, have somebody standing behind you. There will be some repercussion, backlash, as far as the ranchers feel. I wouldn't say it's taking the water from the ranchers. It's only a thing for us to survive as an Indian tribe. I mean, you take away the culture and heritage is what this lake uh, means to us. I mean, you're taking away uh, our human lives. We want to, well, I think we have a right to exist as well as anyone else. Just like the Pyramid Lake Paiutes, there are many other tribes in the West involved in issues regarding their water rights and rights to natural resources. To assist these tribes, NARF assisted in the formation of the Native American Natural Resource Development Federation, which is composed of 26 tribes on the northern Great Plains. One of the members of the Federation is the Crow Tribe of Montana. This is the place where Custer had fallen. 
with his men in the Battle of the Little Bighorn. My great-grandfather's name is Curly, and he was one of the scouts for General Custer. And uh, in the stories that he, he tells, he was the last one that uh, saw the battle from one of the hills for off here. And he watched the battle, and when they were, they were wiped out, he rode out to the Bighorns to report to the boat far west. And he didn't speak English at the time, so what he did was he put a bunch of little sticks together in the ground like this. And he said, Custer, wiped out. One of the original treaties of 1825 that this land was designated to the Crow tribe, without knowing that all of this area would, would be rich one day with natural resources, such as cold, bed and night, some of the wealthiest uh, deposits in the world. There was oil, oil shale, and different minerals that were available. And in our treaties of 1868, it stated in there, as long as the grass shall grow, the waters and the resources will belong to the tribe. It's one vast land that we had at one time given to us by the Great Spirit. It's now being looked upon and everything is taken away from us. In the early 1960s, energy companies start getting interested in the coal in the northern Great Plains area. And of course, with the problems with the federal leasing of public lands, Indian coal became a, a primary target of the energy companies. Practicing Indian law, I've had a, a lot of interest in natural resources, and I've tried to specialize in working with the Indian tribes, and it stems from my upbringing. I was raised on a ranch on the Fort Berthel Reservation in North Dakota. We organized uh, the Native American Natural Resource Development Federation. We're talking about tribes that uh, basically have the same resources. There are uh, coal on a lot of the reservations. There's oil and gas. And I think uh, if Indian tribes are to continue as a, as a separate uh, governmental entity, it is going to be through their land base and through their tribal economies. This organization started about five years ago when people started to realize the Indian people along the Missouri River Basin tribes, including our traditional enemies, the Sioux and the Crows, Shoshones, Arapahoes, the Hiratsa, the Grovan, all the different tribes that gathered together to sort of form a united front to get, to get, get their heads together, to try to work together for it the last resources that we have. Today, when the opportunities are so great, when the stakes are so high, when we have untold millions of dollars worth of resources underlying our reservations, we still don't have all the answers. But the BIA has to recognize that, that uh, there's some religious significance involved here too. These rivers have spirits, just like other forms of life. And we keep doing that, and <clears throat> pretty soon the, our streams are going to burn like they do back east. Now, what I'm getting at is, is in these studies that you're making, how much significance are you laying to the fact that there is a cultural difference, that a lot of us would like to leave this water just the way it naturally is and let it flow the way it naturally Somebody's flows. Somebody's going to challenge your right. Now, you're coming up with a use that's not really been adjudicated, that we don't know whether or not that that's, that's a beneficial use. You can make some good arguments for that, and that's what will have to happen. If it's within the reservation boundaries, if it's our water, and if we want to let it flow the way it naturally flows, it seems to me like we ought to have that right. You know, I can't address myself, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to the spiritual aspects of it. I told you I just started learning about the Indians 30 days ago. I respect that, and that has to be your judgment on how you handle your natural resources. But once you've made that judgment, then it's the time for you to get a little more sophisticated in your financing approach and not let these big corporations run over you. I can assure you in the Middle East, the Arabs didn't have any money when this all started out. The corporations put up the money. You know, you really have to come of date as you have in your legal uh, enlightenment, so to speak, 
you have to start become sophisticated in the financial community because uh, you have, I'm telling you, a lot more strength and power uh, than you realize. <laughs> There's been talk on the radio, television, and media about these claims of the Indians and talk about two-thirds of the state belonging to the Indians, and certainly that's a human interest story. Uh, people often talk about giving certain lands back to the Indians in a jesting fashion. Uh, and I think the media has played this up. It's been much more of a media event in some respects. I don't think there's been much of an analysis in the media in regard to uh, what merits there may be to the claims of the Indians. Presently, there are two suits pending in the federal district court here in Maine by the Pasmaquoddy Indians and by the Penobscot Indians. The Indians are contending that they gave up land or claims to land in the state without being approved by the federal government. The state of Maine separated from the state of Massachusetts in 1820. And uh, we assert that by virtue of being aware of the Articles of Separation, that the federal government ratified the land transactions between Massachusetts and the Maine Indians. Passamaquoddy and Penobscot tribes are two small tribes of Indians who made the mistake, I guess we should say, of being friendly to the United States in the Revolution. Had they fought with the British, we would be sitting in Canada now. They played a critical role in that conflict. and. Uh, uh, fought in the revolution uh, on the basis of and in response to promises made to them by the federal Indian superintendent of the time, a man by the name of John Allen. Allen promised them that they, if they assisted the Americans, they would forever be protected and that their hunting lands would be secured to them and that they would be provided with, with services in time of need. And after the uh, war was over, they were the good guys who finished last because the federal government promptly forgot about its promises and never kept its part of the bargain. But the federal government did keep its promise in one important regard, and that was that in 1790 it passed the Trade and Intercourse Act, which by law rendered void any transaction with any, with any Indian tribe concerning Indian land that wasn't approved by the federal government, thereby, of course, gave them the claim that they have today. It's our position that, that under the laws of the United States, 60% of the state of Maine must be returned to the Indians. Any public official who has a responsibility of dealing in these areas has also a responsibility to the other million citizens of Maine. And certainly, uh, if I'm going to meet my constitutional obligations, I could not in good conscience uh, suggest or recommend the giving away of Maine properties and Maine monies on a case without merit. The state has, uh, has let the litigation go along has apparently taken our offers uh, to negotiate as a sign of weakness, uh, has uh, you know, frequently made jokes about us as a result of that, and let the thing slide. And lo and behold, about a month and a half ago, a very large and prestigious law firm has refused to certify that these municipalities have the power to collect taxes because they say as a result of our lawsuit they can see that there is a question as to whether or not this is Indian land, and if it is Indian land, the municipalities would not have a power to impose taxes, therefore could not raise the money to pay off their notes. The tribe's position continues to be uh, that, they, that they never wanted to see those difficulties uh, come about, that they were willing to talk about a negotiated settlement. But our position obviously must be that there are only two alternatives. Either we continue in court, or else we, we enter into good faith negotiations. We want to be fair. We want to make it uh, as easy as possible. But always, you know, if you uh, take some rights from some uh, from anybody, it, that's going to be hurting, I guess. I know that when I took our rights away, it was hurting here. Right to have ownership, or right to own a house, or right to even borrow some money. We didn't have those rights. Now we do. You know, there have been six to seven generations that have grown up in Maine in these areas. People built homes and farms and businesses. And that uh, these things weren't given to these people. They did it by their own sweat. You just don't undo things of that sort. And, and you can never forget that uh, we're talking about something two centuries old. It just can't be rewritten. It's essential, I think, for us to uh, tell uh, people in here in Maine that uh, 
the land case that we are going to be pursuing is our right. And it's something that uh, uh, we legally own, something that we're not stealing from them. It was being stolen from us. Well, if we get a settlement, the people I've talked to so far, there's about oh, 50 to 75 percent of the people, they want the money to be put in a trust fund to be controlled by us ourselves so that our children and their children and their children will have monies for education and for health and for good homes, jobs, whatever, you know. We don't want the money just to get it ourselves and just divide it up. And spend it, we just want it for the future, for the next hundred or couple hundred years for the kids. There are a small number, a limited number, of these non-intercourse act claims in the United States. But nothing that compares to the, to the 12 million acres that's involved in Maine. We are um, involved either directly or indirectly in almost all of, of the other small claims that there are. In Massachusetts, we have two claims. One is a claim on behalf of the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Head, Mashpee. We've sued for the entire town of Mashpee. Two claims in Connecticut and in New York, there's a United claim. If every tribe in the United States uh, was in a position to have their land returned, I would think that there would be a very good chance that our system of justice simply would not hold and uh, Congress would change the law. Congress does have the prerogative to uh, undo what our government uh, did many years ago uh, when they entered into the treaty. Congress can abrogate the treaties. That's one of the least pleasant aspects of Indian law, is that the treaty promises of 100 and 200 years ago can be eradicated by a stroke of the congressional pen. It's just been a change of battlegrounds over the last 100 years, from guns and bows and arrows now to the halls of Congress and Indian people are really yet to be heard from in this country. They're going to subject this, the Congress of the United States to many very difficult decisions, and there are going to be decisions that have to be made, hopefully, on principles of trust. This nation has undertaken obligations to Indian people through the treaties. I think the primary one is the right to self-determination of the native people, and that right has to be vindicated by the Congress even though it may have to be over the objections of uh, uh, substantial interest adverse to those uh, of Indians. I think what Indian people are asking for today is a recognition and a reaffirmation of the rights that survived that were guaranteed to Indian people during this period and that still exist today. This is what our program is trying to assert on behalf of the tribes that we represent. And in that sense, we're not really expecting non-Indians to feel responsible for the uh, actions of their ancestors and the treatment that uh, Indian people have received uh, for the last 200 years. And we're not asking non-Indian people to do anything more than uh, I think what they would expect for themselves and that is when they go into a court of law and assert their rights they should expect the court to uh, respect those rights and recognize them. <laughs> 